Today we're going to talk about two areas that I'm really excited about. And the two areas are the gut microbiome and epigenetics and nutritional genomics. And these areas of health, I really believe, are going to change all of medicine over the next 10 years. And I think, and I'm hoping, that one of my main missions in life is we used to have like the chicken in every pot kind of theory, and mine is a nutritionist in every, a nutritionist or dietitian or health coach in every medical practice. Because we know that the foundations of health are mostly in people's hands. And then we all have bad luck about other things, you know, but there's so much that's in our control. And even if we do get diagnosed with diabetes or uh, whatever, there's a lot that we can still modulate in our own care. And so empowering people to work on the foundations of sleep and eating helpful foods and getting enough rest during the day and having a sense of meaning and purpose in life and moving our bodies and uh, all of those things are really foundational for health and, and um, what really kind of motivates us. And I think that the way that we practice medicine now, it's all up in the leaves and the, the, tr the trees and the branches where we're so interested in kind of the biochemistry when really we need to be looking at how to nourish the roots of the tree because that's where really a lot of these things happen. And today, even though I'm going to talk about a lot of biochemistry, the bottom line is coming back to the roots of the tree because all the things that we already know to do, these are the punchlines, like eat more vegetables, get enough sleep, okay? The things that we already know that are really good for us are the same things that we want to... I'm going to give you the scientific rationale for eating your vegetables, okay? So, you know, if you fall asleep through the rest of this, you'll at least know to eat your vegetables. Um, so, um, and why these two areas particularly, I think, are so fascinating to me and I hope that by the end of this morning that they're fascinating to you too, is that the research in them is exploding. And we have two things that happened. In the early 2000s, we finished mapping the human genome. And we were shocked to discover that we only have about somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. We have fewer genes than a fruit fly or a carrot, the carrot that I ate this morning for breakfast. We have fewer genes than that carrot. So this puzzle didn't fit. And so people started looking for other pieces. And two of the other pieces that have come out of this are a piece called epigenetics, which is really how our environment affects our genes. And the other one is really the human microbiome. And so I'm going to take you kind of on a journey into both of those areas, and we're just going to see where we get to. And I'm going to ask you to hold questions until kind of the end of the presentation, because I'll probably get to it, and then um, but jot them down, and then we'll have time for questions, okay? So this is... Um, a quote, the gut microbiome is now recognized as a key driver of inter-individual variation, means personalized medicine, in the likelihood of developing obesity and diabetes. That's not something that your doctor told you, is it? My doctor would never say something like that. Much she might, actually. Anyway, and so you start thinking about, okay, so what is the gut microbiome and how does that work and what is it anyway? Well, we are a collection of microbes. And in our gut alone, we have somewhere between three and seven pounds of microbes. And those microbes are um, bacteria and viruses and sometimes parasites and yeasts. And they all live in a harmonious community most of the time. 
Um, and that community runs metabolism and determines um, how happy we are in many cases and um, how much pain we have and helps regulate um, how fat or thin we are and um, how well we use glucose and many other things. And what we know about the genes in that microbiome is that for every human gene that we have, we have one point, uh, we have over a hundred microbial genes in our body. So we are less than 1% of the genes in our body are human. Okay? So sometimes I wonder, like, who, who actually runs who? Am I just like this big microbial machine that's telling me what to do and what to think and how to be? And I don't know, but there, the interplay between this microbiome that sits in every surface of our body um, and everywhere through our body, this interface between the microbiome and our genes they're continuously talking to each other every single second of every single day. And so that's really what I want to talk with you about today is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, how can, how can we really optimize this communication? <coughs> Early morning, my body, my body's still on West Coast time, and okay. So the human microbiome, what's, what all these little pictures are is, if you look at um, these colors up here, these are the main phylum and main um, groups, and you've probably heard about lactobacilli and bifidobacteria because we find these in our fermented and cultured foods, and we take them as probiotic supplements. <laughs> You can also probably see, um, so we've got all these different groups. And then if you take like the microbiome of the inside of the nasal passage, you can see that the colors are really different than the mouse saliva, which is really different than the mouse gingiva, right? And, but not as different as what's happening in the nose. Well. You would think that the saliva and the gingiva would have a lot in common, and that the nose is a little bit separate. And that's actually what you see in the colors, which represent these different phylums. But then even if you look at the tongue or the tonsils, there again, the balance is different. And what the research is showing is that your microbiome in every tissue of your body has its own unique signature. And they're even finding out that every organ has its own circadian rhythm, which is kind of cool too. And even the microbiome has its own circadian rhythm. And we know this from, from uh, Chinese medicine where you can look at the, the Chinese meridian clock and you can see the different organ systems um, take center stage at different times of the day. And so this is ancient wisdom kind of blended with new science. As I was saying, the microbiome regulates many, many, many things. Mood, diabetes, what we decide to eat. And so you can blame your microbiome the next time you dive into something you know you shouldn't eat that's really sugary. My microbiome made me do it, okay? Um, um, Irritable bowel syndrome, we know that more than half of people who have irritable bowel syndrome actually have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that can be treated, like a strep infection can be treated. And um, that people don't need to keep having irritable bowel syndrome, which is really debilitating for people who have it. Um, um, it runs our metabolism, it, it runs our nervous system, it, it is the key to our immune system. Two-thirds of our immune system is in the gut itself. And you say, well, why would it be there? Well, it's there because every day we take a couple of pounds of foreign substance that we call food and we put it in our mouth and our digestive system has to deal with that and decide whether it's friend or foe. 
and um, whether it should be reacting to it as if it's dangerous or not. And so the food that we eat is really the most intimate message that we give to our immune system every single day. And also the, the, the thing that we give the messages to for our microbiome. So this, I'm going to show you some really like fancy slides, but um, hopefully you can just kind of get the gist of this. <coughs> on the left side, we have the healthy gut microbiome. And on the right side, we have the dysbiotic or imbalanced gut microbiome. And, um, and you have copies of all of these slides, so um, just so that you know that. Um, and so on the left side in the, in the healthy one, we have less inflammation, we have less gut permeability, and what gut permeability is, it's um, euphemistically called leaky gut, but basically the tight junctions of the, of the small intestine should sit really tightly together, but sometimes they get pushed apart and food molecules end up going right through um, and into the bloodstream, and some and food molecules, bacteria, chemicals that we've eaten in food, um, and they just go right into the bloodstream. And then we start having immune reactions against what we're eating. So in healthy people, this isn't happening. And we also have, when the gut microbiome's working really well, our insulin sensitivity is also really upregulated. So for people who have type 2 diabetes, um, we always have this problem with insulin resistance. And when your microbiome is healthy, you have less insulin, insulin resistance. And then just on the right side, it says, and when your microbiome is out of whack, all these things are just the opposite. And then right down here, it says, when you got dysbiosis, you got more inflammation, you have um, increased calorie intake, because when the microbiome's out of balance, we keep eating more and more because um, we're not able to actually process the foods as well. We get fatter, um, and then our blood sugar starts going up, our cholesterol and triglycerides start going up, our blood pressure might go up, and then the next thing we know, um, and we're insulin resistant, and then we start developing the type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So um, again, this was just to kind of show you that the that the microbiome in various parts of the body is very different. I put this slide in here, and the main takeaway point in it is these person one, two, and three. It's very, uh, so our microbiome is like a fingerprint. There's nobody who has a microbiome that looks just like your microbiome. But I like to think about the microbiome kind of as a university or a corporation or a business. There might be somebody who seems indispensable to a certain university. Let's say Sarah. She's indispensable here at Montgomery College. Yet, someday she's going to retire and somebody else is going to take her position. And that person is not going to be Sarah. And that person's going to have some strengths that Sarah didn't have and some weaknesses that Sarah was really strong in. But all in all, the function that Sarah is doing now as the head of integrative uh, studies here at the college, that function will keep getting done. And that's what happens in our microbiome, is that we all have different sets of microbes, and we each have about 1,000 different microbes in our stomach, in, in our uh, large intestine mainly, and we have about maybe 1,500 different ones uh, that, that can inhabit the mouth. And predominantly, there's a few hundred in the mouth and a few hundred in the gut that have the main functions, and the rest are kind of like support characters. And these are different for every single person, and, but they can serve the same function, which is to modulate our immune system and modulate inflammation and um, keep us healthy. And, that, and that's their job, and they do a really good job of that, and they talk to our genes. So we're all really different, just like everybody's families are different, our microbiomes are different, just like every company's different, but the functions are basically the same in every family. 
So what we know about the microbiome is the way that we can change it is by changing the way that we eat. And we can change the balance of the microbiome in 24 hours by changing the way that we eat. However, in order to change it permanently, we have to really change the way we eat. Anybody change the way they've eaten in the last five years? Anybody not change the way that something about the way that they eat? And you know, how we eat changes throughout the life cycle. You know, when I was a teenager, we would escape from high school and we would go to McDonald's every day for lunch. I'm not doing that anymore. Really, I promise. <laughs> so um, anyway, so what, what um, this paper by Benmark says is about 75% of the food in the Western diet is of limited or no benefit to the microbiota of the lower gut. Most of it compromised by refined carbohydrates is already absorbed in the upper part of the gut, and whatever reaches the large intestine is of limited value. And this, this um, microbial bloom in the small intestine is really what drives irritable bowel syndrome in a lot of ways. So as we change the way we eat, then that can change too. So I was thinking about kind of cardiometabolic syndrome, which encompasses cardiovascular disease and diabetes and um, hypertension and high serum lipids like cholesterol and triglycerides. And I was thinking about the drivers of a disrupted microbiota. And I started just kind of looking at both of them because I have this slide about what happens if your microbiome is disrupted. And then I started thinking about diabetes and cardiometabolic syndrome. And lo and behold, my lists were just about identical. So that started me looking at the research. Well, I'd already been looking at all the research about really how are these two related. And a couple years ago, I went to um, a probiotic seminar at Harvard, which they have these amazing free workshop. So if you can ever go up to Boston, they're really incredible. And um, Lee Kaplan said something that kind of blew my mind. Gaining 20 pounds between the ages of 21 and 65 is the difference between four to five calories a day or less than half a potato chip, and nobody has that much willpower. Okay, so he's like, he's somebody who's doing rodent studies and working on obesity through the microbiome. And I think that um, in, within the next five years, we're gonna see obesity and mental health treatments totally radically changed because we're gonna be starting first with the gut and trying to have people lose weight through um, working from that perspective and, and also balance. So here's Laurel and Hardy. And um, again, this is just to kind of show you again that there's different, there's different microbiota in lean people and, and obese people. And there's um, also um, different beneficial bacteria microbes that we call prebiotics that are different in people who are obese than people who are lean. And when any of us take antibiotics, we really rock the boat because the antibiotics are nonspecific and they kill a lot of the beneficial microbes. And we know that the more that we do this, the more unbalanced and the more likely people are to have cardiometabolic syndrome as adults, even when they got these antibiotics as little children. So when we diet, and you can kind of look at this graph, I'm gonna look this way this time. Um, when you look at the graph, so firmicutes and bacteria deep. What we know about these two main phylum of microbes is that in people who are obese and people um, who have Alzheimer's and people um, who have uh, uh, neurological issues or attention deficit disorder, that we know that, that firmicutes are very high and bacteria deets are very uh, relatively low. And when people go on a diet, here's, um, the, here's the lean people on the far right, and you can see they have a, certain, a lot of firmicutes and, and a fair amount of bacteria deets, but you can see the obese people that they looked at had almost all firmicutes and hardly any. 
And after a year of dieting, you can see that the microbiome changed. And that was just from losing weight and changing what people ate. So my question is, does the microbiome drive diabetes, or does diabetes drive the microbiome? And I think we have a chicken and egg situation here. So I was talking a little bit before about increased intestinal permeability, which is also called leaky gut. I was on the phone um, last weekend with Stephen Barry, and I said, did you make up that term leaky gut? He goes, yeah, I did. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> he was the first person I ever heard it from. But anyway, and so, um, and he was actually one of the reasons that I got really interested in this whole area. But that's a whole nother story. So what we know is that most people who are eating a really high fat diet are going to have um, an increase of, of um, gram negative bacteria. And these gram negative bacteria in the gut and these were all done, and I have to say, not on high good fat diets, but high fat diets of restructured American food diets. Not like I have beef in my backyard and they're eating grass and I'm eating a lot of grass fed beef. These were all done with people who were eating a standard Western diet. And um, basically what happens is then we change the microbiome. The microbiome has more of these what are called gram negative bacteria. The gram-negative bacteria make these um, fats called lipopolysaccharides that are very inflaming to the gut lining. And they kind of open up the junctions between the cells and they let in all that garbage that I was talking about before and it goes right into the bloodstream. And this also happens in people who have celiac disease when they eat gluten. Because we have a molecule that sits in there called zonulin and occludin and uh, 10 others. And when, when we have these gram-negative bacteria or when we have somebody who has celiac disease, um, this zonulin is like little gates and it opens up the cells. Also, for me, I like to also think about it in another way. It's like you know how when you sprain your ankle or something and how it swells? Because you've got a lot of water in there and it's pushing the cells apart. And that happens also when we have inflammation. It kind of pushes these things apart so that more garbage can get through. Um, anyway, and so this, then when all this, so you get chemical, you know, preservatives and pesticides from your food and a little bit of Roundup, which is glyphosate, and you get some food dye, and then you get uh, food molecules that are too big to actually go th in through the cells where they usually do paracellularly. And, and then what happens is that these molecules that shouldn't go into the bloodstream end up in the bloodstream. And then the immune system starts reacting, which is why people start getting sensitive to certain foods. Anybody have food allergies or sensitivities or know anybody who does? So, so that's kind of what, what starts happening there. And then we start getting inflammation and then we start getting white adipose tissue, fat. We start getting fat. And um, that's not good. <laughs> and we also, it goes to our liver. So what they did was they took um, almost 2,500 people who had cardiometabolic risk, for, and they followed them for 10 years in Finland. Um, and what they found was that people who had more of this gram-negative lipopolysaccharides that opens up these tight junctions in the intestines had more, were more obese, had more metabolic syndrome, more diabetes, and more cardiovascular heart attacks and strokes. Um, and they also had other kind of, uh, these were independent of all the other risk factors of what they were eating and everything else. And so you look at it and go, okay, these gram-negative bacteria and this leaky gut, this is really a driver of cardiometabolic disease. So again, here's just pictures to kind of show you this. These are the cells of the small intestine. These guys right up here. And, um, the lining of the small intestine is only one cell thick. 
And on one end, that's kind of on the inside of your gut lumen, it looks almost like a, a toothbrush. It's got little tiny bristles all over it. And those little bristles have even smaller bristles. Those are called the villi and the microvilli. And that's normally where all the food gets absorbed through. But in leaky gut, these cells get pushed apart or opened. And, and all those chemicals and fungi and mold and other things can get right into the bloodstream without doing that. And so this is what I was talking about, is that you've got the zonulin, which is called VO1, occluding. Um, 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 and the interesting thing to me about this, too, is when um, is this anandamide. Anandamide is a brain chemical that um, gets expressed if we smoked marijuana or vaped marijuana. And anybody who's had the experience of doing that knows that you get very hungry because it turns on the ca cannabinoid receptors. And so as we get obese, this leaky gut increases, and then also our hunger increases as if we were smoking pot, even though we're not. Um, which leads to more permeability and then more insulin resistance. We also know now that people with fatty liver, which is one of the hugest health issues that we have going on because it's so insidious um, and affects so many people and even children, the fatty liver is driven by gut dysbiosis. So gut dysbiosis starts at the top and it makes us be much more efficient. There are certain microbes. Yeah, I do, but it's really bright in here, so I don't think you're seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm using it, I promise you. <laughs> um, so anyway, so you get an imbalance in this gut microbiome, which we call dysbiosis, and then, then what happens is some of those microbes, they get really good at harvesting calories. People who are thin, the difference between people who are fat and people who are thin so people who are thin have gut microbes that don't like to use all the calories. You've probably heard of the, thrift, the, the thrifty gene which makes people fat. No, it's really the microbiome. It's like fat people, they can use every calorie. Thin people, they're spendthrifts. They eat a lot, but they waste a lot. It just goes out in their poop. And so, and so, um, they, we have this increased energy harvest, and then we start making more cholesterol and more triglycerides, and then we get fatter, then we start having more insulin resistance, and then we start seeing our liver enzymes elevated. And so, you know, why we always thought, well, maybe this is just from high fructose corn syrup or something like that, which certainly can change the gut microbiome, and we're finding that this is really the driver. So what we know about people who have gastric bypass surgery for losing weight is that within sometimes 48 hours, people who were insulin dependent are no longer insulin dependent. Did they lose a lot of weight in 48 hours? No. But their gut microbiome changed so dramatically that they became more insulin sensitive. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? Because you think, oh, well, you know, people's diabetes improves so much because they've actually, because, um, uh, you know, they've lost all 100 pounds. No, this happens within the first week after they have their Ruin Y or um, banded uh, therapy. So we know that we have a lot of therapeutic effects of probiotics and prebiotics, and we're just starting to get research in this area on cardiometabolic syndrome. So I wanted to go through some of that. So um, prebiotics lowered fasting and postprandial insulin levels um, and lowered inflammatory markers by 20 to 30 percent. Um, this is uh, probiotics. They found small yet significant changes in weight loss ability in children and adults from a couple different research studies especially with fermented milk products. So think about things like kefir and yogurt. 
um, and pickled and fermented foods, particularly vegetables and beans, could serve as a dietary source of these pro and prebiotics. Um, students of mine, doctoral students of mine at Maryland University of Integrative Health, came to me about a, a year and a half ago with a paper for one of my courses, and it was almost 200 pages long, and it was a chart of what's known about different probiotics in disease. And so this one's on cardiometabolic disease and fatigue syndromes. And if you send me an email, I'm happy to send you a copy of the paper. It was too long to put in your packets. Um, or if you send an email to Pat, uh, she will also do that. And this is a beginning of one of the tables about some of the research that's coming out on obesity and cardiometabolic uh, cardio syndrome we're really starting to see every week more and more and more papers in this area. So again, look for a revolution here. Right now, do, can I tell you, oh, go to your local health food store, or go to Costco and buy this probiotic and you will lose weight and your blood sugar levels will come down? No, I can't do that. But I think that within the next five years, we're gonna start seeing those products on the market. Because we're already seeing a couple for obesity. Um, I've tried one, I didn't lose any weight, but you know. <laughs> but I gave it a shot. But again, you know, I think just like with blood pressure medications or, or even oral diabetes medications, there are gonna be a lot of different ones because what's gonna work for you is gonna be different than what works for just because we're different. Um, and that brings us to a whole nother thing. So anyway, so there's a lot of different foods that are probiotic rich, and I encourage you to put some of these into your diet every single day, um, and try to have something that's pickled or fermented, and I'm not really talking about pickles that you buy in a jar, or sauerkraut that you buy in a bag, um, you want to make sure that it's raw and that it doesn't have preservatives in it. So if you go to one of the health food stores or a um, more gourmet store, you'll find locally made sauerkrauts that are freshly made or like Bubby's sauerkraut or Bubby's pickles or um, things like that. Miso is a food that you know we probably had at Japanese <coughs> restaurants. One of the things I love about miso is it has 150 or more strains of microbes in it. And it doesn't really matter whether the miso has been boiled or, or you've kept it kind of at a cooler temperature, because what we're finding out is that even dead probiotics modulate your immune system. The DNA in those dead probiotics can still talk to your DNA and your microbiome and have a great effect. So if you, like me, have past dated probiotics, keep taking them. Um, um, and, you know, like I don't always, but I often have something fermenting on my counter. And Eleonora Gafton, who is here, right there, she's like one of the queens of, of fermentation. She teaches all about it. and. Um, you know, these are, these are, it's bringing back the old ways that people had. People in every culture have eaten cultured and fermented foods. And here in the States, what happened is that we just put preservatives in them. So we still put pickles on things, but we just put preservatives in them so that they're not really alive anymore. And it's the life in food that gives us life. Oh, and see the beer down there? Beer, wine, those things are good. <laughs> okay, so, so here's, a, here's some research um, I pulled from a lot of different studies. Eating yogurt helps control weight. Okay, eating yogurt probably reduces the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, especially in women. It reduces the risk of gestational diabetes and improved um, blood lipids, cholesterol and triglyceride, and fasting insulin levels. So if eating a little bit of yogurt every day could help you, well, why not have some? Well, what if you're lactose intolerant? Well, you can make cashew milk yogurt or buy almond milk yogurt or 
soy yogurt or coconut milk yogurt. Um, it's really easy to make these other types of yogurt. I make a cashew coconut yogurt that I got off of um, Spunky, I forget, Spunky something, Spunky Gourmet or something. And it's so delicious that I only make it rarely because I would eat too much of it. <laughs> and um, prebiotics are actually the fibers and the colors that are in foods. And I'm going to talk about those more. Um, uh, and these prebiotics also help with um, preventing that leaky gut and help us be more satisfied with what we eat. They help regulate the gut microbiome, help regulate metabolism, and also talk to our genes. So when we eat more of these high prebiotic rich foods, again, it helps balance our insulin sensitivity and also helps with obesity. So um, here's some of the many prebiotic foods. And just in 2017, there's a new definition of what a prebiotic is. We always thought, you know, like have you heard Opran? Opran's really good for cholesterol, right? The government says so. They can, Quaker Oats can put a label saying this is cardioprotective, right? It's one of the few um, kind of foods that, that has a label like that. Well, why? Because of the soluble fiber that's in that. Um, we also have a body of research on something called resistant starch, which is um, if you bake a potato or a yam, and especially if you let it cool down and make potato salad out of it, you have even more resistant starch. And um, that also modulates the microbiome and insulin resistance. What I'm also really excited about, about these prebiotics, is in the new definition of a prebiotic, they include polyphenols. Polyphenols are the colors that are in fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans. Wow. The colors in the food actually talk to the microbiome. And how they do that is that those colors get gobbled up by the beneficial bugs in our microbiome. And as they get gobbled up, the benefits of the ECGC and green tea get released. The benefits of the cocoa that you put in your hot cocoa or that piece of chocolate that get released because they've been partially digested and gobbled up and released by the microbiome. So they have this dual mutual relationship that the microbiota need these colorful foods to help be balanced. And the other food that's on here that I love is um, sea, sea vegetables. So when, again, you go to a Japanese restaurant and you have some uh, nori wrapped around your sushi, you're helping your microbiome. We like all this, right? Food is it. But, you know, anyway. so. So these dietary polyphenols, they do all this fancy stuff. And again, like uh, it's too bright in here for me to actually use my pointer. So, um, but in terms of diabetes, um, they help with, with um, they increase insulin-dependent glucose uptake via um, uh, GLUT4 mechanisms. And GLUT4 is a gene that can be turned on or off. Um, they help with um, all kinds of all kinds of cellular things that really help, and even in people with type one diabetes, we have seen a lot of changes when when people can balance the microbiome. So this is what I was telling you about that symbiotic relationship where the the colors in the food, like in green tea or red wine or apples or onions, get the polyphenols in there get eaten partially by the microbes and get released so they can do their job at the same time they're feeding the beneficial bugs in your gut. And also when we cook with herbs and spices, what we know mostly from Indian research is that when we use things like black pepper and cumin and coriander, um, but I think also oregano and ginger and uh, basil and all the other herbs and spices that we use, what we know in, from herbal medicine is that we call them carminatives. They help make digestion much more easy. 
And so when we add a little bit of ginger or cinnamon, it dispels gas and it makes the food more digestible because it upregulates all of your digestive enzymes, which is pretty cool. Um, turmeric, almost every morning I make a smoothie and I throw a hunk of fresh turmeric in there and I throw a hunk of fresh ginger in there. My husband thinks it tastes pretty bad. I really like it. <laughs> My body really wants that. And um, he's like, no, I'd rather put coffee in my chocolate <laughs> smoothie, um, which he does. And he, it does taste delicious, but that's not the point. So um, anyway, what we know about these you know, rich herbs and spices is that they decrease inflammation. And um, they're just really helpful for us. And so cooking with more herbs and spices, thinking about adding them in, even if you're making eggs, putting a little uh, fresh basil or oregano on your eggs, um, sprinkling a little bit of turmeric on your eggs, putting different kind of herbs and spices, no matter what you're eating, to spice it up because it helps digestion, but it also helps modulate the microbiome and gene response. I made this table and I am not going to go through it. You have a big copy of it in your handouts. Um, but I kind of looked through everything that I could find in the research that prebiotics were good for, and I put it on something called the functional medicine matrix. And if you look in the bottom boxes, communication and transport, what you can see is that um, we do have research on diabetes and metabolic syndrome. We have, um, it, because pre these prebiotic-rich foods help regulate insulin and glucose. They lower hemoglobin A1C. Um, uh, they help balance lipids and increase serum glutathione. Glutathione is our primary um, internal detoxifier that pulls chemicals and metals and things out of the body. And um, sometimes we see that, that people who have diabetes, they just have really chemical or heavy metal overload or mold overload, you know, giving some, a name to something doesn't necessarily mean that you found the root cause of it. And so kind of looking more deeply can help um, also. And then in terms of cardiovascular disease under transport, um, helps normalize LDL cholesterol, serum triglycerides, decrease C-reactive protein levels, and reductions in blood pressure. So eat these colorful foods, herbs, and spices, and eat your fermented foods. And there are some references for that chart. And here's just a short list of some of the many prebiotic-rich foods. And you can see pretty much every vegetable is on here. And every root vegetable, pretty much every grain, beans, um, onions, dandelion greens, uh, fermented dairy products. And then also mushrooms. I've been staying with a friend while I've been here, and we had a delicious shiitake miso um, dish, um, fish dish, the first night I came. Um, and then herbs and spices, like shoot for at least one to three teaspoons a day of dried herbs and spices or one to three tablespoons a day of fresh herbs and spices. Any of you have little herb gardens? They're so easy to grow. They're weeds. Even I can grow them. They're really easy to grow. Um, yeah, like you, you put some, some in the ground, the mini will come back year after year, and they just proliferate. They're really great. So um, we do have some research on taking prebiotic and probiotic supplements and putting them together that they help with weight loss um, and metabolic syndrome. So we're starting to see, this one's on 46 people. Um, they were either given a placebo or a probiotic, prebiotic supplement for 12 weeks. Um, and um, 20 billion colony forming units twice a day. And they had improved blood pressure, more weight loss. Um, in the placebo group, the weight loss stopped at six weeks, but continued in the people who were taking the probiotic. Um, this is um, symbiotics, prebiotics, and probiotics in people with type 2 diabetes. And again, they gave um, prebiotic and probiotic with inulin, 
which comes from Jerusalem artichokes for 12 weeks and found the same kind of results. You know, improved fasting in glucose, serum insulin. Mostly, I'm not a big fan of people taking probiotics endlessly. Um, I think we ought to try to get these prebiotics and probiotics mostly from food. However, when people have like a health issue, then I would say, well, why don't you pulse them? Why don't you take them for eight to 12 weeks now and then stop and then maybe six months later do that again, but with a different type of probiotic? Because when we take probiotics all the time and the same ones all the time, we keep feeding our microbiome with the same thing. It's like having a monocrop. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I um, did this test called Ubiome, where you can test your microbiome. And um, I had had a kidney infection, and I'd been on massive amounts of, of antibiotics about six months before I did it. And when it came back, it showed that the functions of my microbiome were working really well, but that the diversity, diversity makes everything better, you know? That the, how many different types of microbes I had were really terrible. I had only 7% of like the best people, okay? <laughs> so I'm like, wow. So over the next year, I started taking more and more probiotics and I started eating more pre and probiotic rich foods and, um, and you know, and all the whole time I'm feeling pretty good. And, um, and then we were moving to Oregon from Maryland. And so the day before we left, I said, you know what, I'm just going to get this kit off my plate. I'm going to do it again. And my diversity went down to 2%. Okay. I said, I wonder what role stress plays in this. <laughs> you know, maybe the day before I'm moving cross country wasn't the best day to do a test. Um, anyway, so now that I've been there a year, I'll do it again, you know. But I think, like, taking probiotics every day, I was giving myself less diversity because I was getting less from the food because I was always pouring in this huge amount of probiotics that didn't allow the, the microbes from the food that I was eating to really take hold. So food is really our best medicine, but... But these studies can show us that you can kind of give yourself a big push. Um, and then this is in children, showing that you can lose weight by taking pre and probiotics. And again, more on weight loss. This is on lactobacillus rhamnosus. They gave t um, in pretty low doses, 1.600 million. So not even <laughs> like 1.6 billion um, plus um, prebiotics. And they found that um, the weight loss was uh, biggest for women than in men. And men lost more weight just by stopping eating calories, which we know. Because men can stop eating dessert and drinking, and they lose weight. And women do that, and nothing happens. <laughs> That's so unfair. Um, yeah, it's sometimes if we have an attitude towards you guys, that's why. <laughs> so anyway, um, so probiotics for, for type 2 diabetes showing a meta-analysis, which means that they've taken a lot of studies and they've looked at all of them and put them together and to see like what really happened. Reduction in hemoglobin A1C and reduced HOMA scores, which is about insulin resistance. Um, but they didn't see changes in fasting glucose or insulin levels or C-reactive protein. Which probiotics help with weight loss? I made a whole list of them. We don't know, okay? And this is the golden goose. If somebody can figure this out, invest in this, okay? It will be your Viagra or something. That, you know, like if we had all invested in that a long time ago, we'd be rich now. So um, if they figure this out, um, we're going to all invest in it, right? Um, and metformin, one of the interesting things, I mean, metformin has a lot of negative aspects to it, but one of the interesting aspects of metformin is that we take it in multigram doses, just like a prebiotic. And we're starting to have research, at least in mice, that indicates that one of its mechanisms of action is that it modulates the microbiome because it has a prebiotic effect. 
And then this is, I'm going to talk briefly about fecal transplant, but this is um, a butterfly eating poop off a leaf. And uh, in the animal kingdom, a lot of animals eat poop. Humans don't eat poop until recently. But, um, but um, this is um, research where they looked at uh, obese people. These just happen to be pictures of women. Sorry about that. And um, what they did was they measured their microbiome, and then um, they gave fecal transplants to people who had a RUNY gastric bypass surgery to lose weight and um, uh, a gastric band surgery. And what they found was that the microbiome changed dramatically from doing this fecal transplant. So what's this fecal transplant? They basically take the poop from somebody who's very healthy. They give, um, they liquefy it. They used to use blenders to do this. Now it's a little more sophisticated. And basically they give an enema. And by giving this enema one or two or three times, you can really help with weight loss. Um, the FDA has approved this for people who have recurring um, Clostridium difficile infection, which is an infection that causes a lot of diarrhea and um, can lead to death in many people. And so um, it's about 95% effective in those people after sometimes just one of these fecal transplants. We're also seeing that in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, these fecal transplants are about 50% effective. So if you had 10 people with ulcerative colitis and you knew that you could give them each two or three of these fecal transplants and half of them would no longer have ulcerative colitis. If I had ulcerative colitis, that would be a risk I would be willing to take, you know. Um, and then we have um, many companies who are actually packaging fecal materials in pills, and they're called poop pills, and they're coming out as experimental drugs, but soon they'll be on the market as drugs for some of these things. I think in diabetes and obesity, if we can, one, find a probiotic that really works amazingly well, that would be my first choice, right? Uh, or a set of them that work well in different people. But this is also another very dramatic and very quick shift where you can start seeing people losing weight by having a healthy microbiome. And it's pretty dramatic. It happens very quickly, and people start feeling very different. Um, we also see that in mice, they took identical twins, one who was hugely obese and the other one who was very lean, and they took the, the fecal material from each of these human twins and they gave it to um, germ-free mice, and the germ-free mice ate this poop because mice will eat poop. And, um, and the ones that got the poop from the obese twin got very obese. The ones that ate the poop from the lean twin got very thin. So then they said, well, what if we do something different? What if we put somebody, um, these mice, on a low-fat, high-fiber diet, um, and we do the same thing? What will happen? And nothing really happened, because the, I think the low-fat, high-fiber diet already was protective. Um, then they put a high-fat, low-fiber diet and they gave the lean mouse got to eat poop from the fat mouse, and then the lean mouse got fat. So again, the prebiotics, the fibers, were really the, the key. So when we eat a high fiber diet, high prebiotic diet, we're more likely to be more lean. Now, we're not mice, but this has been um, replicated in humans. Um, so that just tells more about that. So in case, uh, on YouTube right now, we have all these people showing you how to do these fecal transplants at home. I can get the poop from my best friend who's thin, and I can just give myself a fecal transplant or two and lose all this weight. It sounds like a miracle. Don't do it, okay? Um, because, because like any other organ transplant, there's a lot of genetic information that's coming in. And what if somebody has um, 
hep C? Or what if somebody has HIV virus? Or what if somebody has something else going on that is undiscovered? Um, or maybe maybe they're thin, but they're really anxious. So now you're fat, you're lean, but now you're anxious. Okay, so you don't want to just do this at home. And here's at least one case report in the literature where there was a woman who had recurring Clostridium difficile infection. Her doctor said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to get you give you a fecal transplant. Um, they decided her daughter, who was 16 years old, would be a really good candidate because she was very healthy. But they screened her and they found that she had a helicobacteria pylori, H. pylori infection in her stomach, even though she didn't have an ulcer. And they treated her with massive amounts of antibiotics. And then, after doing that, then they gave her mom the fecal transplant. Well, after that, both the mom and the daughter gained like 35 pounds that they could never lose. And I have to tell you, after I took all those antibiotics for that kidney infection, I immediately gained eight pounds, and I've only lost maybe five of it so far in two years. You know, um, we know that antibiotics, what do we give? We put antibiotics in animal feed to fatten them up. So organic dairy products, <laughs> you know, organic dairy products, organic meats and poultry when you can. So setting the stage, how, we, how do we set the stage? I mean, most of us aren't setting the stage anymore. We're already here. But this is also like a shameless uh, thing for me to be able to show you my granddaughter when she was only three <laughs> weeks old. Um, so the infant microbiome, we know now from research that we set up the microbiome the first three to five years of life. And um, in, setting up those micro, in setting up the microbiome, that sets up the health of the baby through their adult life. And so we know that uh, where in the world somebody lives, the microbiome of somebody who lives in um, Ethiopia and has a dirt floor is different from the microbiome of somebody living in um, Rockville, okay? We know that the different type of ethnic foods that we eat affect our microbiome. And when people are eating more traditional foods, they have a more robust microbiome. Um, the baby's gestational age at birth, whether that baby was breastfed, whether that baby was bottle fed, makes a difference if the baby was born vaginally or by C-section. And having pets, especially dogs in the home, really helps set up the baby's microbiome. Because you know they share food and licks and all kinds of things, <laughs> toys and everything else. No, that's a dog toy, but your baby is um, gumming it. Um, antibiotics and obesity. Babies exposed to antibiotics during pregnancy, the risk of obesity nearly doubled. Antibiotics in infancy increase the risk of obesity, diabetes, and Crohn's disease. And um, you can see this. The more antibiotic ch babies and small children are given, the bigger the risk. So, you know, I know one of the main reasons why we give babies antibiotics is for I'm looking around the room, we've got a lot of probably grandparents in here, you know. But babies get a lot of ear infections. And we know from the American College of Pediatrics, they don't recommend giving antibiotics for otitis media. They just don't. They haven't for 20 years. For inner ear infections, yeah. So what can you use? You can use homeopathy. You can use um, warm comfrey mullein oil in the ear, you know. when. Uh, when my kids were little, I would make a mixture of um, vinegar, peroxide, and alcohol because um, they would swim in the bay, and sometimes the bay was really a little, got a little dirty in the summer. We lived in Hawaii. And um, so I would put these drops in their ears. There's you know, simple solutions that you can use that aren't antibiotics that won't affect the baby's microbiome. So remember I said um, diet has the biggest effect on the microbiome, so think about what you're eating, especially those probiotic and prebiotic foods, eat your vegetables. And here's my hypothesis. And this is just a, definitely a Liz hypothesis. This is in my brain. But you know, when somebody has diabetes, what's the first thing we control? Sugar and what do we start counting in their diet? 
carbs, right? We limit carbs and we're very specific about carbohydrates, sugars. When somebody has GI issues, we do exactly the same things. If I'm working with somebody with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or I do exactly the same thing. I take the carbs out of their diet, right? And then sometimes I use something called a specific carbohydrate diet um, or a FODMAP diet, which kind of regulates all this. So I started thinking about that, and then I started thinking about this researcher whose work I was reading in the uh, mid-1980s. His name's James Anderson, and he was at the University of Kentucky, and you're shaking your head. Because what he did was instead of limiting people's carbohydrates who had diabetes, he started feeding them really high-fiber diets loaded with tons of legumes. Beans, beans, beans. And the average person eats maybe 13 to 15 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, between men and women, probably we should have between 25 and 35 grams a day. Um, he was giving people 40 to 60 grams a day of carbohydrates, and sometimes even more, but in the form of legumes and root vegetables and whole grains. And type, their type 1 and type 2 diabetes were really responding to this which is more similar to this high prebiotic, high fiber type of diet I was talking to you about. So my hypothesis is, what if the reason that we can control blood sugar and insulin levels with diet is because we're controlling carbohydrates because we're changing the gut microbiome to be more healthy? And that's my hypothesis. And um, you know, if I had some money, I'd probably do a research paper on that, but I don't. But I think that you know, if, if carbohydrate counting works for you and doing low carbohydrate diet works for you, great. But I'd also encourage you to try doing things like having a high prebiotic rich diet and having more whole grains and more beans. So having things like quinoa, and, or, which is actually a seed, um, or amaranth, which is a seed, or more brown rice, or, or having more yams and potatoes and beans and lentils, making things like rice and dal, and just checking your glucose and see what happens. You know, one of the great things about, about um, having diabetes is that you have your own measuring system where you can look at any moment in time to see what happens to your blood sugar levels. And I remember working with a woman who went on, um, called the Hawaiian diet, which was a high taro root, high yam, high fish, high vegetable diet. And uh, within, um, she was on this uh, research study that a colleague of mine did. and. Interestingly enough, on the Hawaiian diet and going for walks, within two days she was off all of her insulin. But what she discovered was that if she had a bite of carrot or a bite of papaya, her glucose levels would spike. It wasn't that she ate a half of papaya, it was that she had a little bit of papaya, her body had a reactivity to papaya. And I know that you've heard Jay Srimani, um, speak, and I know that um, uh, Dr. Jaffe's work has been presented here, but you can really see that certain people have certain foods that don't make any sense, that will, eat, will help their blood sugar or hurt their blood sugar. And so if you're somebody who uses a glucometer, I would encourage you to experiment and say, okay, so I'm doing this diet because my dietitian or my nutritionist told me to, and it's been working. Now I'm going to experiment and I'm going to try certain foods and see what they do to my blood sugar. So eat that food and then half an hour later take your blood sugar and see what happens. You live in your body. You're the one who can figure this out better than anyone else. And so, you know, I just want to encourage you to kind of play a little. Don't do anything dangerous, but experiment just a little. So the takeaways is... Whole foods, eat whole foods, high in vegetables and fruit, not so much fruit. 
eat a diet that regulates glycemic control, um, which may have a lot of fiber and prebiotics in it, avoid, eat high quality fats. Um, most people get their fats from processed foods. And you know, for me, cooking at the end of a day, I work hard, but cooking is an act of self-love and a, a way of nurturing myself and a way of expressing creativity. And my meals are very simple. You know, I make turkey burgers and steamed broccoli and a big salad. I mean, it, it, and maybe a baked potato or a yam. It might not be anything very interesting, but at least I'm feeding myself and I know exactly what's in the food and what's not in the food. Um, anyway, I think I've talked about all these foods. And additional, additional considerations when people have diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, it's like, what's driving this? Okay, Dr. Mark Hyman um, reports even people with type 1 diabetes that you can lower their insulin needs pretty dramatically by changing somebody's diet and getting their, their, um, their microbiome balanced and getting their hormones balanced and looking to make sure that you don't have mold or chemicals or um, we have a, a whole body of research on, on chemicals like bisphenol A that we get in cash register receipts causing endocrine disruption and that endocrine disruption leads to more obesity and diabetes. So, you know, by looking at some of these underlying possibilities, um, you can also really help. And then you can provide support for increasing the healing of leaky gut by using glutamine or colostrum or aloe vera juice or a number of things. And so, you know, I would encourage you to, um, I think the human body has this self-healing property. It's not 100%. But I think that we can always feel better than we feel today if we make some steps to making some changes tomorrow. And so by working with um, an integrative nutritionist or dietitian or working with an integrative physician, you might get a little bit more um, movement in how you feel and how your diabetes is working um, for you than you do from your regular doctor. And I'm not saying ditch your regular doctor. I'm saying, you know, look outside the lines a little bit because um, as somebody who has, like, I have a, a congenital uh, genetic kidney disease, and I know that my doctors, their answer is, well, let's just keep your blood sugar, your blood pressure controlled and wait till your kidneys fail. And I'm like, well, that is not really a really suitable answer to give me. Okay, and I think in a lot of the ways that we treat medicine, it's kind of like, well, I know in five years I'm going to feel be worse than I am now, and um, but what if in five years you could actually be better than you are now, and that is my real belief, and that's my hope, and so I hope that I've inspired at least one person in this room to think a little bit differently. So again, I think really the research is starting to show that the gut microbiome is what's driving cardiometabolic disease. And that's all I wanted to say. So thanks, everybody. We have a few minutes for questions, but please wait for Philip to bring me the microphone so everybody can hear the question. And I'm so glad that. Liz actually flew in from Oregon on Thursday night because the airport was closed on Friday. <laughs> so, anyone have a question? I think you had a question earlier you wanted to ask. Um, Here, wait for the phone. What supplement do you find works in general that an all purpose for anyone? Although I know it varies from individual to individual. What kind of a supplement? Just a basic supplement? Yeah. So if I were going to do something really basic, if I were going to do something really basic and I was working with somebody who had diabetes, um, I would probably get, there's a Metagenics product and I'm not thinking of what the name is exactly. And I think other companies make the same type of products, but it's, um, they're called wellness packs. And basically they have 
a multivitamin with minerals, they have extra fish oil, and then they have a blood sugar control supplement in there that might have ashwagandha and holy basil and um, gymnemna sylvestri and, and um, more B vitamins and uh, extra magnesium and things like that that really help regulate blood sugar. And they come in these little packs and you take one in the morning and you take one at night. And it makes it really easy because you don't have to really think about it very much. Um, so I think that would be kind of a simple go-to um, for me in terms of somebody, if I was working with somebody with diabetes and I wanted to make it really simple, I would just go to um, packs that were designed for somebody with, with blood sugar issues. In your case and in other people's cases, when they have to take an antibiotic, other than the making sure you, you also eat a yogurt every day, what else can you do? I would take a probiotic. Which one? Not at the same time. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go through that. So, the the probiotic that I recommend the most, and I don't have a blackboard uh, handy, but it's called Saccharomyces boulardii. Oh, mercy. <laughs> and that's why I'm gonna write it down. Oh no, I'm not. Okay, it was a good idea. Oh. Thanks, Philip. Okay, it's, Go ahead, spell it. it's Saccharomyces, S-A-C-C-H-A-R. Saccharomyces. M-Y-C-E-S, Boulardi. Saccharomyces Boulardi. And what I like about it, thank you. What I like about Saccharomyces Boulardi is most probiotics are bacteria. Saccharomyces boulardii is a cousin to bread yeast. So it's a yeast. So you can take it at the same time that you take your, your antibiotic and it doesn't get killed. Now, if you're taking an antibiotic that also kills fungus, like maybe you're taking fluconazole, uh, not fluconazole, or um, flagyl, or, but amoxicillin Saccharomyces boulardii will work. Although, yeah, it, it'll work. So, um, Anyway, and then if you're, you're taking something different, then what I would recommend is just taking them at a different time of day and just take a good broad spectrum of probiotic. Um, and health food stores now make some good ones. Udo's Choice makes some good ones. Um, there's, there's plenty. I would just ask at the health food store. By the way, uh, Liz was talking about coconut yogurt. I put a paper in everybody's folder with the coconut yogurt that I make. Five minutes, I make it at least once a week. So anybody has issues with milk, dairy. So there's a keeper coconut keeper and a coconut yogurt recipe. So I have one question for Liz around the FODMAPS diets where we're pulling out all these gorgeous foods. Is your recommendation, what is your recommendation on FODMAPS diets? Okay, the FODMAP diet is a therapeutic diet. Thanks, Sarah. It's a therapeutic diet that's to be used short term for people who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of research in inflammatory bowel disease for it. And what it does is it takes out all those good prebiotic rich foods that I told you about. It takes them all away temporarily, um, plus more. And um, because it takes away anything that can be fermented or utilized by the microbes because you're starving them out. And so what we know is that when you're on that diet, you kill, you starve off a lot of the bad microbes, but you also starve off a lot of the good microbes temporarily too. So it's a diet that is not meant to be used long term. It's a diet that's to be used maybe 8 to 12 weeks to um, get somebody to a different place. It's also generally done also while people are taking antibiotics or while people are taking antimicrobial herbs. It's, it's a part of a package. And then you really work on healing so that somebody can eat as much as possible. My philosophy about diets is how can we put somebody on a therapeutic diet to have a huge effect. I know that if I can put somebody on the right diet 
within two, for them at that moment, within two weeks, they're gonna feel different. And I think for those of you who've gone on a diabetes diet and monitored your blood sugar, you can see that almost immediately you can make a change, right? Um, so, so that's a really good thing. And you can see these changes very quickly. And then my goal is, okay, how can I nourish and strengthen this person so that gradually they can broaden their path and include more food? You know, and, and I think that's what I was trying to encourage you to do by monitoring your glucose levels, monitoring, but seeing which foods really spike and which foods don't. You might find that something like, uh, that you always thought was great for you, like eating a hamburger, spikes your blood sugar. But maybe it's because you get it at a restaurant and it's got some fillers and things that aren't that great for you. Or, you know, but if you make it at home, you might find that a hamburger is great for your blood sugar. And so, you know, that's why I'm encouraging you to experiment. And then you can know your own body and you can figure out what's best for you. Thanks, everybody. Okay.